Hi, uh, welcome to the Semantics Lecture on Entailment. And we've seen entailment as a relationship between two propositions, where when one of them is true, the other one has to be true. So if you think, if you take, say, P and Q, right, we say that P entails Q when, whenever P is true, Q is true. And then whenever P is false, well, Q can be whatever it wants. Right? But whenever P is true, Q is going to be true as well. So this is the entailment relation. We say that P entails Q. Now, entailment is really something that we can pull out of a sentence compositionally by looking at the different parts of a sentence. So we can say, well, it's not 100% correct to say this, but we can say that every building entails every house in the sense that in a lot of contexts propositions with the phrase every building will entail the exact same proposition except that every house instead of every building. So just to give an example, if I say every building on my street is on fire, that entails that every house on my street is on fire because any time that every building is uh, on fire, right, that's going to include all the houses. A house is a kind of building. If I say there is a KU student in my office, that entails that there is a student in my office uh, because a KU student is a kind of student. Now notice in both of these cases, I say uh, one is a kind of another. Right? And you can think of uh, words as you know, pseudo entailing one another when one is a kind of another. So right, a linguistics major is a kind of student or a kind of KU student in this case. So if I say there's a linguistics major in my office, that entails there's a KU student in my office. At least we understand this to mean KU linguistics major. And that entails that there is a student in my office. So we have this kind of entailment, but if you've been paying close attention, notice that it's not quite the same kind of entailment. And we like to divide entailment into two directions. So we, we talk about downward entailment, or DE, when a phrase uh, entails one of its kinds. So every building entails every house. And we like to talk about upward entailment when we go from the kind to the container? I guess the larger kind, right? The thing that contains it. So we have downward entailment and we have upward entailment. Um, and uh, for our purposes, we can use these symbols up and down to be more precise if we want. So we can say P entails Q, but we could also say that P downward entails Q, or we could say that P Upward entails Q. Right, so downward entails or upward entails. And we might say, well, why do we bother noticing it? Well, one is it helps us understand what's going on. And another one is that it actually allows us to classify different expressions. So you might say, well, why am I using downward entailment here and upward entailment here? Well, it doesn't have to do with building or house or with the nature of students. What it has to do with, actually, is the other part, every. And you notice, I, I use the phrase, there is a student. There is a student in my office versus every. So if I say there is a student in my office, it doesn't entail that there's a KU student. If I say there's a KU student, it entails a student it, upward. If I say every student is in my office, well then that entails every KU student. Now, 
keeping in mind that uh, every gets a little messy. <clears throat> you know, there's a contextual restriction to it. If I say there is a building on my street that's on fire, that does not entail that there is a house. There could be, uh, it could be a fire station or something else. If I say there is a house on fire, then that entails a building. So as it turns out, these determiners, which we call quantifiers, or uh, we'll call them determiners more specifically later on, um, but these, uh, these words trigger different kinds of entailments. And so what we, can, what we can do is use these terms to create contexts or environments that are downwards or upwards entailing as we need them. And it helps us figure out exactly what our predictions are. It also helps us classify them, and we'll talk about that later when we get into these quantifiers in more detail. Uh, that we can divide a lot of them based on their entailment patterns. And it tells us something about what they mean. Now, there's actually a very interesting, uh, there's a very interesting consequence of this distinction as well that helps us understand an issue in syntax. <clears throat> so you're probably familiar with the concept of NPI, the negative polarity item. And this is a word or a phrase or an expression that can be found under negation, but not outside of it. So something like any, not the free choice any, but the NPI any, uh, at all, ever, and the thing is that NPIs appear in a lot of contexts that aren't negation. They appear in questions. They appear in if clauses. And they even appear with every. But you have to be careful. They don't appear in the sentence of every. They appear inside the determiner phrase that's built by every. So, um, Again, we have to be very careful about which part of the sentence we're dealing with. But what we notice is that these, you know, these are not NPIs, or these are not negative in any sense. So how do they license this apparent polarity item? Well, uh, uh, you know, Bill uh, Ladjusaw uh, discovered, uh, I think it was about 1980, that these NPIs don't just appear where there's negation. They appear when we're in a downward entailing environment. So that's why they appear with the DP of every, because right, we've seen that's downward entailing. Um, and then uh, another downward entailing context is a question. Um, so it's, you know, we haven't talked about the meanings of questions, but uh, essentially it's downward and tailing. Right? If you say, uh, if you say what? And questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> right, so you know, it's downward. This is downward and tailing. Now, a question is downward entailing at all. We haven't talked about the truth of questions, uh, but essentially, question you know, if, if a question covers buildings, it will also cover house. That is to say, uh, it, any answer to this question will include possibly an answer to this one. Now, uh, if clauses are also downward entailing, so uh, if I say, if you see a student, tell me, well, okay, any time you would tell me, right, would be a time you saw a student. That entails that if you see a KU student, tell me, because they're a student too, and so forth. Right? If you go into a building, tell me. So that will include if you go into a house. Right? That entails that. 
So these are all downward entailing contexts, and they license NPIs. And then what we'd want to understand then, what we'd want to understand is why that's the case, and that's something that we can uh, go into once we've formalized these concepts in a little bit more detail. Uh, in any case, right, what we've seen though is that we can replace this concept of negative polarity, which is a syntactic concept, with downward entailment, which is a purely semantic concept. And we want to understand how you know, the semantic concept links with the syntax. But this is an early example of how we can kind of uh, wrest the analysis away from something that's purely syntactic, which is what was in vogue in the 60s and 70s, and towards something that is uh, semantic, where we find uh, more of a distribution of labor in the grammar.